let's move on to transactions and uh, what we ex what we expect there. The research group has analyzed almost 20 years of transaction volume information on a quarterly basis. We also measured that transaction volume against what happens to property values. There is a very strong correlation between the two metrics. Said another way, when property prices decline, not, mean, not many investors want to jump in and buy assets until they feel like the worst is over. In the investment community, we we call this try not to catch a falling knife because your hands need to be really precise so that you don't get cut. Usually when prices are falling, we see transaction volumes decline. That's the bottom line. In 2009, we saw transaction volumes decline 90% and virtually across every property type as investors took a wait and see approach to how the economy was going to respond and how underlying economic performance changed at the asset level. Right now, we're in a bit of that period as we try to determine what's happening with rent collections, not only in different property types, but in different areas as we try to survey what the damage is and is going to be in underlying economies. It doesn't necessarily mean that property prices are going to fall 90%. That's not what I'm saying. What I'm saying is the decision that investors have whether or not to invest capital is going to experience a period of what we call price discovery. Investors are trying to figure out what they want to pay and sellers are trying to figure out what they're going to be able to get from those investors. When you have a bid ask gap and you're in a price discovery mode, that typically results in a decline in volumes. The last period that we experienced was in 2009. It was actually 2016 when this took place when we saw a modest drop in volumes of approximately 15%. This time we're expecting something between what happened in the greater financial crisis and uh, 2016, something between 15 and 90%. I know that's a wide range, but that's just where we are right now, not a lot of data points. The good news is, and I'm finally going to get to some good news. The good news is that we have a period of high liquidity in the investor community, both in the equity market and the debt market. And what do I mean by that? Looking at the amount of capital that commercial real estate investors have raised over the past several years, it's evident to see that the overwhelming majority is comprised of opportunistic and value add investment strategies. What does that mean? That means that 76 billion and 60 billion dollars of opportunistic and value capital respectively are available to come in and buy assets targeting higher returns. And we now have an environment for that capital to come off the sidelines and deploy. Again, we're in a bit of a catch the falling knife scenario and investors are gonna be waiting to see a bottom in economic performance of assets, or they're only going to be interested in assets that have long term durable cash flows before they come off the sidelines and start to deploy that capital to achieve the yields that they promised to their investors. In the debt market, what we see is a very balanced market from a uh, origination market share standpoint. If you look at 2007 on the bottom right hand side of your screen, what's abundantly clear is that the CMBS originators contributed more than 50% of originations leading into the financial crisis. We should have seen that that was an unsustainable scenario. And in, pre in previous years, we've been watching to see whether the CMBS market would ever get above a third of the market. It got pretty close to doing that in 2014, but ever since then it's lost market share as other lender types have come in and com competed very uh, aggressively with CMBS originators. One of those types of originators are the debt funds. When you combine the CMBS CMBS and debt fund originators in 2019, you see that they still control less than a quarter of the market. So the composition of the origination market is actually very healthy. The question is, are lenders going to be confident at their ability to underwrite credit risk when they're originating loans to new borrowers? Another consideration is the number of loans that are going to be maturing in 2020 and in 2021. Fortunately, CMBS and debt fund uh, maturities are not substantial relative to the total. And while $400 billion of loans are maturing in 2020, that's less than a typical year's worth of mortgage originations. And what we've seen is that many lenders, while not completely willing to let a lender avoid paying debt service, lenders are very flexible and they're willing to work with borrowers to uh, assist in uh, their payment of debt service if they come into a period of uh, uh, default. What we would like to see is the government provide a little bit more guidance in terms of what they're going to ask lenders to provide to landlords in terms of forbearance. If we were to get that type of guidance, we think that 
landlords would be more willing to work with tenants on rent uh, relief. In terms of the debt fund and CMBS market, one thing to watch is credit spreads. What we've seen in the CMBS market is a very dramatic increase of the amount of yield that lenders require borrowers to pay in order to get a loan. This has effectively stopped CMBS issuance uh, entirely. And in the debt fund market, we've seen a lot of debt funds get squeezed uh, just because their ability to originate loans is predicated on the lines of credit that they get from other regulated financial institutions like Wells Fargo, JP Morgan, Bank of America, and Citi. Once we see some stability in these spreads and in the corporate bond market, we think we're going to see insurance companies and banks come back to the originate, origination market uh, with uh, more confidence.